Welcome to MEC 410 Chapter 5 in our class Design on Machine Elements. I'm Jay Mendelson. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Stony Brook University. Chapter 5 is about the design for different types of loading. And so you'll read that chapter in our book Machine Elements in Mechanical Design 6th Edition. And the homework problem shown here will be assigned to you in Blackboard. In this chapter, we're going to learn about design for different types of loading, repeated fluctuating shock and impact loading, and how to define the stress ratio and how to do stress analysis for those different types of loading. We're going to review the maximum shear stress and distortion energy theories for failure of ductile materials, define the fatigue and endurance limits, and we're going to use the Goodman method for designing parts subject to fluctuating stresses. You'll be calculating a design factor for stress analysis and calculating if designs are safe when you're given a design factor. Here's the basic definition of stress ratio. You have your max and minimum stresses, sigma max and min. You calculate a mean or average stress from the sum of the max and min stresses and divide by two. And you calculate the alternating stress sigma sub a as the difference between sigma max and sigma min and divide by two. We then define the stress ratio r as the minimum stress divided by the maximum stress. This is an example of what repeated and reverse stress means. Imagine a shaft that is held on two sides in bearings and a motor turns the shaft and there's a yoke which provides a load and the yoke rotates around the shaft. And as the shaft rotates, the yoke creates downward concentrated loads in two places. This causes the top of the shaft to see a compressive load followed 180 degrees later by a tensile load. All parts of the shaft see what is called repeated and reverse stress from the change in direction of the bending stress. So sigma min equals the negative of sigma max, and r equals minus 1. To see what this looks like dynamically, we can briefly watch this YouTube video. And as the shaft continues to rotate, this section in the middle starts to neck down. And eventually it just breaks. Now we get different r values for different types of fluctuating stress. If your max and min stresses are both positive and both of them are well above zero, then when you divide the min by the max stress, you're going to get some number between zero and one for R, the stress ratio. On the other hand, if we look at case B in the right upper side of the slide, if the max stress is a positive number, but the min stress is a negative number that's close to zero, then by the time you divide the min by the max, you're going to get some number for stress ratio R between minus one and zero. If you have a compressive mean stress that is somewhat less than zero, your max stress is a number slightly greater than zero, but your min stress is significantly less than zero. And so R is going to be some value between negative infinity and negative one. And if you have a compressive mean stress, then all stresses are compressive. Your max and min stresses will both be negative numbers. Your ratio R will be some number between one and infinity. Here's an example of how to analyze fluctuating stress. It shows a cam follower on the left side and this cam follower is such the center of the cam is not the center of the circle. The center of rotation is offset here to the right where my mouse is pointing. And with the follower on the right, as the cam rotates, this follower is going to move back and forth. And as the follower moves back and forth, supported on this bearing, the nose of the follower will touch this beam and push it out. And then the beam will come back and then it'll get pushed out, it'll come back. Each of these little balls coming out of a track will be ejected once to the right. The total excursion of the follower is five millimeters during one revolution. 
The thickness of the spring is 0.8 millimeters and the width of the spring B is 6 millimeters. What we want to do is compute the maximum and minimum stresses in the bean, the mean, and the alternating stresses, and then compute the stress ratio R. The length of the beam is 65 millimeters, and the max and min deflections are either 8 or 3 millimeters, so that there will always be some stress in the beam. Point A at the base of the spring experiences the maximum tensile stress, which is here. And then when Y max equals 8 millimeters, we are going to have our max stress here at point A. And when Y min equals 3 millimeters, we're going to have a positive value, but the minimum value of stress at point A. And so our case for alternating stress where sigma max and sigma min are positive numbers, when we do expect R to be a positive number between 0 and 1, and we dial in here in Excel in this input data format, the length of the spring, the modulus of elasticity for E, all the values for the dimensions of the spring in meters. And then we start calculating values. First, we calculate the cross-section moment of inertia I and figure out the force on the spring at three millimeters. Then we figure out the bending moment, M min, which is equal to the force, P3 times the length. That gives us the bending moment that's a minimum. And we do the same for the max in order to get the bending moment when the spring is deflected eight millimeters. We also know that our distance from the neutral axis is half the thickness, so it's a small number, only 0 0.0004 meters. And we can calculate M min, the bending stress on the spring caused by the minimum moment, which is 176 MPAs. And we calculate the maximum stress caused by the maximum moment, which is 470 MPAs. And then we can calculate here near the bottom the mean stress as the sum of the two divided by two and the alternating stress as the difference between the two. And then we can take the stress ratio R, which is the minimum stress, 176 MPA, and divide out by the maximum stress, which is 470 MPA, the stress ratio R equal to 0.38. Now we're gonna review principal stress formulas that you have from Moore's circle, if you remember that one from last year's classes. Our max principal stress sigma one is the sum of sigma x and y plus the square root of sigma x minus sigma y over two squared plus tau x y squared. And the minimum principal stress is sigma x plus sigma y over two minus what was in the square root formula. Tau max is the square root of the quantity sigma x minus sigma y over 2 squared plus tau xy squared. Failure theories are going to be used to establish how do we know if a design is safe to use. The maximum shear stress theory, MSST is the acronym. The ductile material yields when the maximum shear stress exceeds that of the yield stress in a tensile test specimen. We know that the stress level is considered safe, meaning the part won't break, when tau max is less than or equal to SY over 2N, where tau max is the max shear stress, SY is the yield stress, and N is a factor we call a design factor or safety factor. And the idea is that the larger a value for the design factor the more conservative the design's going to be, and the smaller the number will allow for the maximum shear stress in the design. We have a second theory called the distortion energy theory, and that makes a different assumption as to how you know when a ductile material yields. It says that the ductile material yields when the yield stress exceeds what is called the von Mises stress, sigma E, which is calculated as the square root of the quantity sigma one minus sigma two quantity squared plus sigma two minus sigma three quantity squared plus sigma three minus sigma one quantity squared all divide by two. And again, those sigma one, two, and three values are 
three principal stresses for when you have a 3D state of stress. And in this theory, known as DET, the stress level is safe when von Mises stress is less than or equal to SY over N, where SY is the yield stress and N is a design factor. And then you may ask yourself, well, what's the difference between these two theories and how do we know which one's right? And the answer is neither is right, neither is wrong. To understand that, we can plot what's known as a yield locus on a graph where sigma A is the stress on the x-axis, sigma B is the stress on the y-axis, and the distortion energy theory equation, which is this one, very nonlinear equation, yields a rotated ellipse, the dark line, when plotted in this way. And the maximum shear stress theory, which is a simpler equation per this slide, yields a six-sided figure, dotted lines here, and both yield locuses are such that if the xy stress as a point plotted is interior in what we call the non-yield region, then the part won't fail. And if the actual stress in the part is external to the region, then the part will likely fail. If you look at the plot of the yield locus for distortion energy and maximum shear stress, these curves are actually very close. In fact, here where my mouse is, this one region, two, three, region four, region five, and region six here, those small six regions are the gray area between understanding which theory better predicts failure. The distortion energy theory with its slanted ellipse in the curve will actually be a little more aggressive. It says the stress can get a little bit larger without failing than you get for the maximum shear stress. And as to which theory to use, in general, if we have an understanding of the von Mises stress and we're able to calculate it from the available data, we tend to use the distortion energy theory. And if we have a calculation uh, only of what the shear stress is, tau max, or if we have a part that's loaded only in shear, then we tend to use the maximum shear stress theory. Here is design example 5.4 in our book. It's design of a bar and rod for a welded assembly. And what we're going to do is use these theories to determine what dimensions we should assign to our components for a given force. And in this example, we have a rectangular bar of length from the attachment point, that is, of length B, and unknown width, and an unknown height. And we have a force on that bar downward at 250 pounds, which will lead to a bending in that bar and will lead to a shear stress. And the bar is welded to this circular rod. And so what the bar is going to do as the force is applied is cause this rod to rotate. And in particular, it's going to give a torsional stress on that rod as well as bending moment. And the largest stress on that circular rod of unknown diameter, but of a known length, 8 inches, will be at element B. The largest stress on our rectangular bar will be at element A. So first we're going to design the rectangular bar, then we're going to design the circular bar. We've decided in this problem to use steel for both parts of the bracket because steel has relatively high stiffness and ease of welding. We're going to specify SAE 1340 annealed steel and we know from Appendix 3 that SY is 63 KSI, SU is 102. That steel is highly ductile with 26% elongation, but therefore we know we can use our maximum shear stress theory that we showed you on a prior slide. And in this calculation, we first see that there is a bending moment at point A of 12 times 250 pounds or 3,000 pounds that acts in the YZ plane. And we show here 
the beginnings of an Excel spreadsheet where on the top in gray we show you all of the core dimensions of the parts that are known as well as the material properties. The calculation of the mending moment is easy to get 3000. It's just 250 by 12. And the max stress at point A on the bar is a sigma A, which is equal to that 3000 pound inches bending moment divided by S, the section modulus. And we also know that for the design stress on the bar, that the design stress sigma D is equal to SY over N, where SY is our yield strength of the bar. And we can calculate the ratio of sigma D over S, therefore, to be 31,500 PSI, because we know N is equal to 2, and we know M is equal to 3,000 pounds per inch. The height and the thickness are both unknown, and we only have one equation to solve them. So we're going to arbitrarily let the height equal three times the thickness for the aspect ratio, which will give us good stiffness of this rectangular bar. When we solve for bar section module S, it's equal to TH squared divided by 6, which with H equals 3T equals 1.5T cubed, and 1.5T cubed equals the moment divided by the design stress, and that equals 0.095 inches cubed. We can then solve for the bar thickness T, which equals the modulus S divided by 1.5. Take all that to the one third power and we get 0.399 inches. Our bar height then becomes 1.197 inches, which when we use the preferred size in appendix table 2.1, gets expanded to 1.250 inches. And thus our preferred size to use for the thickness becomes 0.375 inches. We update the value of S to be T sub P times H sub P squared divided by 6. We get 0.098 inches cubed, which is slightly higher than the minimum required number of 0.095 inches cubed. Here we show the use of the preferred sizes. If you have, for example, a size between 5 sixteenths and 3 eighths of an inch, you would round up to 3 eighths of an inch or 0.375 inches. And if you have a size between 1 and 1 and a quarter inches, you would round up to 1.25 inches. And we've used in our, for our numbers, 3 eighths and 1 and a quarter as preferred size. In design example 5, dash 4, the loads on the circular bar are uniaxial tension combined with torsional shear. And we can calculate an equivalent torque where the circular bar is loaded at one end by a downward force and a torque. The downward force causes bending in the bar with the maximum moment at the support point denoted by element B. And the moment causes a tensile stress sigma x on top of the bar also shown at element B. Figure 429 from chapter 4 shows the Moore circle for uniaxial tension and torsional shear, where the max shear, tau max, is R, the radius of the circle, which is equal to the square root of the quantity sigma x over 2 squared plus tau xy squared. Sigma 1 and sigma 2 principal stresses are given by the two equations in the lower left corner. And if we combine the equations for tau max with sigma max equals the moment over the section modulus and tau xy equal to the torque over the polar section modulus, we get that tau max equals the square root of the quantity m over 2s squared plus t over zp squared. And we know from our appendix, because it's a circular cross-section, that zp equals 2 times s, and therefore tau max equals the square root of m squared plus t squared over zp. 
we define the quantity in the numerator of this equation to be the equivalent torque, Te, so that tau max is equal to Te over Zp. Now we can calculate more values for this example. We can calculate the moment on the circular rod as 2,000 pounds inches, because the moment is just the force times the distance A. And the torque on the circular rod is 3,000 pound inches, because the torque is the force times length B. And then the equivalent torque, shown per the equation on the prior slide, becomes 3,606 pound inches. The polar section modulus Z sub P is equal to pi times D cubed over 16, and the polar moment of inertia J is pi D to the fourth over 32. So we can calculate then the maximum shear stress tau max equal to T sub E over Z sub P in terms of the factor one over D cubed. And so it's 18,363 PSI per inches cubed. We then can calculate the design stress on the bar tau D set equal to tau max, which is equal to SY over 2N, and tau D equals 15,750 PSI. Then setting tau D equal tau max, we get D cubed is 1.1659 inches cubed, which when we take the cubic root of that, we get 1.052 inches. Rounding up to make it easier to weld, we can use 1.100 inches. Let's discuss some failure theories due to what's called fatigue loading. Fatigue loading is caused by fluctuating stresses. In this case, the yield and ultimate strength do not really represent the ability of the material to resist fatigue loading. An endurance or fatigue limit is used to calculate a stress level of failure. The endurance limit is well below the yield or ultimate strength and depends on the number of cycles of fluctuating stress. Low cycle fatigue being under a thousand cycles of stress and high cycle fatigue being greater than a thousand cycles of stress. Here's an example of fatigue failure in an Austin Healey 100S crankshaft shown in the upper right hand corner. The car is in the upper left corner. And this diagram of the engine shows that here at the bottom where I've got my mouse, that was the weak link in the crankshaft. And frequently in this vehicle, the crankshaft, which now I'm showing where my mouse is in the upper right corner, would actually fail as shown in this photo. It turned out to be a weak length. In reality, the whole diameter of the shaft needed to be larger which wasn't easy to do in this design because there was no room to make the crankshaft diameter at that location larger. Endurance limits are found from test specimens, such as the data shown in this graph. For stresses underneath 10 to the 6 cycles, or a million cycles, SA is the stress amplitude level for a given number of cycles to failure, N is the number of cycles to fail at a given stress level. S sub N is the fatigue limit or endurance strength of the material. And B is the exponent related to the slope of the curves, where the slope of the curve depends on the material, as shown by the four types of steel and aluminum materials uh, denoted on the right side of the graph. We have that the, the sloped section of this curve on this log-log graph where the y-axis is stress amplitude in MPA and the x-axis is the number of cycles of stress application N is equal to S sub N times capital N to the B. And once you get over a million cycles or so, the curves tend to flatten out and the stress level SN at the endurance limit is such that the part should last forever if the actual stress in the part is below that value. Endurance strengths are modified for manufacturing, reliability, and stress 
conditions. So in our procedure for estimating the actual endurance strength, S prime sub n, we first specify the material for the part and determine its ultimate tensile strength, S sub u. We then specify the manufacturing process used to produce the part, paying attention to the condition of the surface in the most highly stressed area. This is figure 5-11 from our book in which we have five different types of manufacturing processes for a part. And the way we use the chart is we first look up what is the tensile strength S sub u in KSI for our material, define which of our five manufacturing processes we're using to make the part, and then we intersect an x value for the tensile strength with the curve. In this case, I'm showing a red circle for machined and cold drawn steel. And then we read across to a y value on the chart. And in this case, we would find that for a tensile strength of 100,000 KSI, that the endurance strength S sub n is roughly 38,000 PSI. We determine next a material factor C sub n from the following list, where the material factor just depends on whether using steel or cast iron and what type of steel or cast iron. So you pick a value. Wrought materials are usually rolled or drawn, and they are the most common materials that we use in the examples in the book, in which case the material factor C sub n is 1. We then determine a stress factor where C sub st is equal to 1 for bending or 0.8 for axial tension. We then determine a reliability factor C sub r where most commonly our reliability factor is 0.99 which is 99% reliable and CR is 0.81. You compute a size factor C sub s either from the table on the left, which shows the equations to use, whether your dimensions are in English units or in metric units. And note that there are the size ranges are given in different equations for different size ranges. You can get an approximate value for the size factor C sub s by using the graph on the right. And then you compute the estimated actual endurance strength S prime n from the formula S prime n equals Sn times C sub n times C sub st times C sub r times C sub s. There are some qualitative factors that also affect the endurance limits. Limits tend to be reduced to internal cracks or voids. If you operate the steel parts well above 500 degrees F, you'll have a lower endurance limit. You can have anisotropic material properties, which are common in rolled sheet steel and bar stock. You can have residual tensile stresses due to machining and grinding. And if you have corrosion in your material from salt or acids, you'll never hit the endurance limits that our equations predict. If you want to increase the endurance limit, you can use shot blasting and peening to get an ultra smooth surface or you can use nitriding to increase the surface hardness. Here's example problem 5-2 on the endurance limits. They want you to estimate the actual endurance limit of SAE 1050 cold drawn steel when used in a circular shaft subjected to rotating bending only, and the shaft is machined approximately to a 1.75 inch diameter. We assume a reliability factor of 99%. We look up that the tensile strength S sub u is 100 KSI. It's a machine manufacturing process. And our basic endurance strength from our figure then becomes 38 KSI. The material factor CM is 1 because this is wrought steel. The stress factor is 1 because we have bending stress. 99% reliability factor begets a 0.81 reliability factor. And our size factor from the equation CS becomes D over 0.3 to the minus 0.1 power is 0.824. 
and as a result our modified endurance strength is 25.4 KSI. In example 5.3 on endurance limits, we want to estimate the actual endurance strength of Castile having an ultimate tensile strength of 120 KSI when used in a bar subjected to reversed, repeated, and bending load. The bar is machined to a rectangular cross section that's one and a half inches wide and two inches high. And in order to compute the estimated actual endurance strength of the bar material, we have to use a concept known as the A95 area, which is shown in the figure as two strips having a thickness of 0.025 of H, where H is the height, at the top and bottom of the section. And the A95 area, which is the 5% of the area that is on the outside of this bar is equal to 0.05 times HB. The A95 area comes from the fact that only the top and bottom segments of the circular section beyond the diameter of 0.95 D, where D is the diameter, experience 95% or higher of the maximum bending stress. So if we equate the A95 area for a circular section to that of a square section, we find that the effective area of the square section that we use to understand the factor CST is equal to 0 0.808 times the square root of HB. In this example, where we have a height of 2 inches and a width B of 1.5 inches and a tensile strength SU of 120 KSI using a manufacturing process of casting, we find that the basic endurance strength is 44 KSI using our figure. And our material factor is now down to 0.80 because we're using casting as a process. It's still reversed bending stress and so CST is 1. The reliability factor is 0.81, and the size factor DE is calculated from the equation 0.808 times the square root of HB, we get 1.4 inches. And then we use our size factor C sub S in the equation D over 0.3 to the minus 0.11 power, and we get size factor is 0.844 such that the modified endurance strength S prime N is now 24.1 KSI, significantly less than the basic endurance strength of 44 KSI. In designing for cyclic loading of ductile materials, a yield line is plotted on a graph where sigma A, the alternating stress, is on the x-axis and sigma M, the mean stress, is on the y-axis and a part is safe when its stress state is below the yield line. And this area below the yield line, so this triangular region, is a safe area to operate the part in based on what you calculate for the alternating and mean stresses for the part. The equation for the yield line is given by sigma A divided by SY plus sigma M divided by SY equals 1, where SY is the yield stress. The problem with yield lines is they do not account for stress concentrations. Different researchers, guys named Gerber, Soderberg, and Goodman, propose different safe criteria for designing your part. They're indicated by the equation shown on the right and their corresponding curves on this graph. We're going to use the equation postulated by Goodman, which is in the lower right corner, for this course. As described in chapter three, stress concentrators are due to a sudden increase in stress due to a dislocation in the part geometry. Using a stress concentrator, the max stress, sigma max, equals kT times the nominal normal stress, and the max shear stress equals KT times the nominal shear stress. Stress concentrators can be disastrous for brittle parts due to part fracture. And you must use KT in areas of cyclical tensile stress. 
When you're designing a part, you want to use gradual changes in geometry, fillet radii, blending of mating surfaces, where possible to reduce the stress. You can find the stress concentrator curves to use in our course in Appendix 18. There's two examples shown on this slide. Or if you want more comprehensive and exact calculations, you can go to a website called www.efatigue.com. In these graphs, we show on the left the stress concentrator for a stepped flat plate in tension. KT is on the y-axis. The ratio of the radius of curvature at the fillet, so that's over here, divided by the width of the plate, T, is on the x-axis. There are different curves, three to be exact, given for the ratio of the small width of the plate T divided by the large width of the plate W. On the right, we show the stress concentrator curves for a round bar in bending. There is a large diameter D and small diameter little d, and a fillet radius blends the gap between the large and small diameters. On the y-axis, you have the stress concentrator to use, kT, and on the x-axis, you have the ratio for this fillet radius, r, divided by small d, and there's three curves to use given by the ratio of the large to small diameters. If your ratio of large to small diameters falls in between the three curves shown, then you interpolate between them in order to get a value of kT. In the Goodman criteria, we use S prime n, the endurance limit, on the y-axis shown in this red circle, and SU, the tensile stress, is the intercept on the x-axis. The Goodman criteria is commonly used for shafts subject to cyclical stress, which we will study in chapter 12. The equation is kT times sigma A divided by S prime N plus sigma M divided by SU equals 1 over N. kT is the stress concentration factor and N is our design factor. And kT also applies to sigma M, the mean stress, when guarding against failure due to low cycle fatigue, although this is not a common occurrence. We have four different Goodman criteria for fluctuating stress on ductile materials. The four equations to use here are shown for the normal stress design equation on top, that's our most common one, but we can also use the Goodman criteria to check yielding and tension for a shear stress design equation where there is no normal stress and to check the yielding in shear. Now we're going to show how to use the Goodman criteria for fluctuating combined stresses. For the maximum shear stress theory, MSST, we draw two Mohr's circles one for the mean stress, one for the alternating stress. And from the first circle, we determine the maximum mean shear stress, tau m max. And from the second circle, we can determine the maximum alternating shear stress, tau a max. And then we use these values in the design equation shown, kT times tau a max divided by s prime sn plus tau m max divided by ssu equals 1 over n. And in the absence of any shear strength data, we can use estimates. S prime SN equals 0.577 times S prime N, and SSU equals 0.75 times SU, where S prime SN is the modified endurance limit for shear, and SSU is the ultimate tensile strength for shear stress. Here's a few design tips that you can use to reduce fatigue loading. You want the point of maximum bending moment to occur where your diameter of the shaft is largest. You want to use very large radii to blend small diameters to large diameters. And you want to avoid any other sudden changes in cross-section 
as well as features like notches and holes at points of large stress where the local stress concentrators can magnify these large stresses. On the right side of the slide, you see the pistons of a four-cylinder automobile engine and a crankshaft. And some of the things that the automobile designers do to reduce fatigue loading is to specify highly polished surfaces at the location of critical stresses and provide large radii where the diameters change abruptly. Generally, you want to try to machine the shaft parallel to the major axis and increase surface smoothness with shock blasting or nitriding. And you want to avoid process methods that produce residual stresses, such as welding of the shaft and rapid quenching heat treating. And if you do have any surface irregularities, you want to lap them or electro-polish them. Design factor N increases proportionally to the uncertainty in the design data, which basically means if you're uncertain about the loads, material properties, or the stresses, or if you have very high safety concerns about your design, you might use a design factor N greater than or equal to four, if you just have static loads and your design data is very accurate, you might use a small value of design factor somewhere between one and a quarter and two. Just keep in mind that if you go with a large design factor, then automatically you're not going to allow high stresses in your part to occur as a function of the yield stress of the part which also means you're probably going to have to go with fairly large dimensions on diameters of shafts and it means your shaft is going to get kind of large expensive and heavy you use a suitable factor n in the design process to design a product so that all components are safe first you pick a value of n and specify all of the design data and dimensions and you alternate the sequence of the design analysis depending on what's known and what's not known. You also may find that you postulate a value of n and then find that your design is not safe. In other words, that some of your stresses in the design are still approaching that of the yield stress. And in that case, what you'll wind up doing is having to pick a larger value of design factor n. Here's some data to define when designing machine parts. First, your application. You want to know things like the production quantity and process and what your cost budget is for your parts. If you have high consequences of failure, you're going to pick a large value of n. You also have to budget what's the physical size and weight of the part and how the part's made in the assembly. From environmental considerations, you have to concern yourself with temperature range, exposure to voltage and current, and atmospheric exposure, and noise and vibration. Extreme environmental conditions will likely require higher values of safety factor N because these extreme environmental conditions will tend to increase the mean and alternating stresses that are in the part. You need to understand the nature of loads during startup, shutdown, and normal operation. You want to understand if the loads are static, repeated, and reversed, whether they're fluctuating, whether they're shock or impact loads. And you want to define your loads per what are the maximum mins and then calculate the means and alternating stresses. You have to understand if the loads are axial or compression, whether they're bending, whether they're shear from direct shear forces or whether it's shear from torsion. And you want to understand the effect on the stresses due to the simultaneous application of different stresses. In extreme conditions in shafts, you may have to worry about buckling. Your required material properties include the yield strength, ultimate tensile strength, compressive strength, endurance, stiffness, ductility, toughness. Are you going to use a steel ferrous material such as plain carbon alloy or stainless or does your design warrant the use of non-ferrous metals such as aluminum brass and bronze are there going to be any weaker materials in your design such as plastic ceramics or wood you are well advised to use ductile materials which have greater than seven and a half percent elongation 
If necessary, you can use brittle materials, which generally are defined as less than 6.5% elongation. The ductile materials are highly preferred for components subject to fatigue, shock, and impact loads. And you must also understand the thermal electrical properties. Here's three ways that you can run through your design process. In method one, the component geometry and loading are known and then you just apply the design factor n to the expected stress to determine the required strength of the material. Choice two is that the component loading and material are known, and then you compute the design stress by applying the design factor n, calculate the max allowable stresses, and determine a safe geometry based on the location of the max stresses. Third choice is that you know the component geometry, loading, and material, in which case you compute the expected max applied and design stress. You compare these stresses to determine a suitable design factor N, and you redesign the component if the design factor N is either too low or too high. Here are some practical considerations for you when designing machine parts. First off, the design has to fit within the overall production cost budget. You can't arbitrarily over-design the part just to know that the part is going to be infinitely safe. You should be checking with your suppliers for material availability and your specified dimensions and tolerances in line with mating parts, which we'll cover in chapter 13. You should be making components as small as possible, especially when they must fit inside a fixed size housing, such as an automotive transmission housing. You round dimensions to standard sizes of raw material, and you have to specify tolerances in line with the actual manufacturing process. An over-specification of tolerances will just be rejected by whichever supplier is trying to machine your parts. You should try to specify smooth finishes as a way to meet stress levels. Otherwise, your cost could go up dramatically if you try to just increase dimensions arbitrarily. And note that painting and planing will increase dimensions very slightly, which you'll have to take into account when specifying part tolerances. Here's design example 5-1, in which a large electrical transformer is suspended from a roof truss of a building. And here's what that actually looks like. Now you may wonder why would anyone want to suspend something so heavy where it could drop on someone's head. In actuality, this is how buildings are constructed before all the electrical connections are made. Temporarily, a large transformer will be suspended in order to hook up and connect the electrical voltages and do testing. It'll be dropped into place once you test all of the connections. So in this problem, the total weight of the transformer is 32,000 pounds and you want to design the means of supporting the transformer. You can assume the transformer load is static, and per this photo, it's obviously protected from the weather, temporarily suspended in an indoor environment, and you're going to use two straight cylindrical rods to support the transformer, connecting the top of its casing to the bottom cord of the roof truss. Now, in this case, one could assume that the Two rods will share the loads equally in service, so 16,000 pounds. However, it's possible that only one rod will carry the entire load in case one of them breaks. So in this case, component loading is known, and the material of the rod and the dimension of the rod will be specified in order to fix the geometry. In our example, we're picking SAE 1040 cold-drawn steel as a material. And the yield strength of the rod per appendix 3 will be 71,000 PSI. And because we have some uncertainty about our design data, and because we have some safety concerns, we're going to have a design factor N of 3. When we calculate the design stress, sigma D, it's the yield strength, 71,000, divided by 3, the design factor. So we get 23,666 PSI. The tensile area of the rod is then the force, which is 32,000 pounds, divided by the design stress. So we get 1.352 inches squared. And we look up on appendix table A2-2B for an appropriate thread size. 
and we find that a thread size of 1.405 inches squared, which is slightly larger than what we need, which is 1.352 inches squared, corresponds to a 1.5 inch dash 6 UNC thread. The thread area of 1.405 inches squared is then greater than the minimum value we need with a design factor of 3. Here's another example, which is the design of a pin for a production conveyor system. In this design, a part of a conveyor system for a production operation is shown in figure 5-16, and the pin connects a horizontal bar to the fixture. The empty fixture weighs 85 pounds, but when you put a cast iron engine block on it, now it weighs an extra 225 pounds to carry it from one process from another. And you're going to experience many thousands of cycles of unloading and loading of the engine blocks because you're going to be making many thousands of cars that use the engines. And your job is to design the pin to attach the fixture to the conveyor system. Here is a diagram of the system. You have a pin to be designed, which is shown here in the middle. And the bar to be designed will do in the next example, design example 5-3. And over here on the left, it shows the shear load on the pin is actually supported in two different places, one on the left, one on the right, as this view AA is the attachment of the carrier to the bar where section AA is indicated here in the middle. If you want to see one of these conveyor systems, what it actually looks like, here's a photo I found online. It shows that an operator is able to push and pull this engine block manually because this bar and pin system is what's actually being used to hold the weight of the block. So our general approach is to pick a suitable pin material and design factor. We're going to find the mean tau m and alternating tau a shear stresses. And we're gonna use the Goodman criteria to create an equation for the endurance limit as a function of the pin area. Once we know the pin area, we can select the pin diameter. So we know that the minimum shear force is 85 pounds and that's just the conveyor and when we add the conveyor with the engine we are up to 310 pounds which is the maximum shear force. We've picked SAE 1020 cold drawn steel for the pin material which has a yield strength of 51,000 psi and a tensile strength of 61,000 psi. The stress concentration factor KT is 1 because the pins are a uniform diameter and because of the uncertainty about the loads and design data and in addition because of additional safety concerns of having people around moving these engine blocks on the production floor we've selected a design factor of 4. We can calculate the mean and alternating forces on the pin from the equations shown here on the right. And we can calculate the mean and the alternating shear stresses as a function of the area of the pin. And note that the shear stress is equal to the force divided by two times the area of the pin because the pin is supported in two places, which is known as double shear. The basic endurance strength from figure 511 of our material with a tensile strength of 61,000 psi, we looked up, it's 23,000 psi. Our material factor is one because this is wrought steel. We don't quite know the type of stress factor, so we've assigned the higher value of 1 for direct shear. We're going to go for 99.9% .9 reliability, which gets a reliability factor of 0.75. We're going to use the largest size factor, CS, because the pin will generally be kind of small. And then the modified endurance strength is the product of the various factors at 17,250 PSI. Now the stresses are going to be found from the fact that the mean shear is equal to the mean force divided by two times the area. And the alternating shear is the alternating force divided by two times the area. 
which means that the three mean principal stresses are going to be sigma m1 is fm over 2a, and sigma m3 is fm over minus 2a, and sigma m2 is just zero because this is a pure stress condition. And the three alternating principal stresses are calculated in a similar way, yielding similar equations. We then apply our Goodman criteria from equation 5-32, which is shown on the lower left corner, kt times sigma prime a over s prime n plus sigma prime m divided by su equals 1 over n, where sigma prime a is sigma a1 minus sigma a3, and sigma prime m equals sigma m1 minus sigma m3. And expanding the Goodman equation, we get the equation up on the top, and then we restate our equations for the principal stresses on the second row. And when we combine the above three sets of equations, we get kt times fa over a times s prime n, plus fm over asu equals 1 over n. Doing some more algebra, we solve for a with the equation shown. And we can calculate that a equals 0.0390 inches squared. Diameter d is then just the square root of 4a over pi, which comes out to 0.223 inches. In design example 5-3, we're designing the square bar for the production conveyor system which is shown in figure 5-16 below. Now the complete system will include several hundred hanger assemblies like this one, we're just designing one. And we're gonna design the horizontal bar that extends between two adjacent conveyor hangers and supports a fixture at its middle. The empty fixture weighs 85 pounds, the cast iron engine block weighs 225 pounds, and it's hung on the fixture to carry it from one process to another where it's then removed. And the bar will experience several thousand cycles of loading and unloading. Here, we've already determined that the hole for the fixture pin is 0.223 inches, but in this example, we've over-designed the hole to be 0.50 inches. And section AA shows a cross section of the bar where the height is H, the thickness is T, and there is a hole going through the bar. It is modeled as a simply supported beam where we have to determine the bar height H and the maximum deflection Y, which is equal to minus PL cubed over 48 EI. We have a load P hanging down in the middle of the bar directly over the hole for the fixture pin. The thickness of the bar T should be large enough to provide a good bearing surface for the pins to ensure lateral stability and to prevent buckling. And as a design decision, we're using a thickness of T equals 0.5 inches. On the left, we show the shear and moment diagrams for the fixture only, and on the right, it's the fixture with the engine block. The shapes of the diagrams are similar, except for the fact that the fixture only in the middle has a moment of 510 pound inches. When you add the engine block, that moment goes up to 1860 pound inches. As a general approach, we're picking the bar material and a design factor. We're going to find the mean and alternating bending moments, use the Goodman criteria to find the endurance limit as a function of section modulus S. We're going to solve for the minimum required section modulus of the solid bar and the bar height, round the bar up to the nearest preferred size, then solve for the section modulus with a half inch diameter hole for the pin, checking that the actual section modulus is still greater than the minimum required. And last, we will check that the max deflection of the bar is small enough to be acceptable. Here's our solution to design example 5-3. The input data is shown in the gray area. The max force on the bar is 310 pounds and the length of the bar is 24 inches. We chose SAE 1020 hot rolled steel, which has a yield strength of 30,000 PSI and a tensile strength of 55,000 PSI. We assumed a bar thickness of a half inch and we needed a first estimate of bar height of two inches because we have to calculate initial size factor. 
we've assumed a pinhole of half an inch. We have a stress concentration factor of one because the small hole for the pins does not significantly weaken the beam. And we have a design factor of four, mostly due to the safety concerns. The mean moment of the beam is calculated from m max plus m min divided by two, and the alternating moment from m max minus m min over two. And our bar section modulus s without the hole is th squared divided by six. We have a basic endurance strength of 20,000 psi. We've chosen a reliability factor of 0.75 because we want 99.9% .9 reliability. The size factor DE is 0.808 times the square root of HB, where we're assuming the initial tri value of H equals 2 inches, which yields a size factor of 0.897 and a modified endurance strength S prime N of 13,451 psi. The Goodman criteria is shown here where my mouse is. Rearranging terms with the Goodman criteria and equations for stresses sigma m and sigma a, we get this equation I'm circling with my mouse. And now we can solve for section modulus s with this third equation here on the right and get 0.2869 inches cubed which when we solve for d equal to the square root of 6s over t, we get a bar height of 1.856 inches, which is not that much different from the initial 2 inches we assumed. We like using h equals 2 inches because it's a preferred size. And the actual value of d divided by h is 0.25, which is okay. It confirms our assumption to use kt equals 1 when d over h is less than 0.5. The bar section modulus at the whole location is equal to t times h cubed minus d cubed, all divided by 6h. And that value of 0.328 inches cubed for s is larger than the minimum value of s calculated before. The bar modulus of elasticity is I equals TH cubed over 12, which is 0.333 inches to the fourth, which yields a maximum beam deflection of 0.089 inches, a small number, and even smaller when we take the maximum deflection per inch of the beam and get only 0.00037 inches per inch, which is well under the typical required deflection limits in these bending problems of 0.003 deflection per inch of the beat.